you're going to fucking die. That is the only thing that you have to worry about. It's like, there's an end to this. You don't have to worry about, oh, I, I tried something I wasn't gonna do and I failed. So what, at least you tried. That's better than the people sitting on Twitter being mean all day. Today's guest is David Semmer, an ex-founder and host of the Founders Podcast, one of my absolute favorite podcasts, where each week, David devours a biography of a founder and shares his favorite lessons with the world. Whether it's Charlie Munger, Steve Jobs, Jeff Bezos, Kobe Bryant, the Wright brothers, there are so many founders. He's close to 300 episodes now. But David has a really interesting story himself and one we dive into today. We talk about his tough childhood and how his escape came through his obsession with books because it was within those pages where he found the role models he wanted and needed to inspire him on his way. We also discuss some key themes between the founders and innovators whose stories David has shared. From a self-styled delusion, which helps the founders to ignore the naysayers and dream the impossible, to the obsession which comes with a laser focus on what matters. There are lots of great stories and anecdotes as you can imagine from David, but there are also some great lessons that he has learned about success on his personal journey and why he wants to build something his younger self would be proud of. You're listening to the Danielle Newnan podcast and here is my conversation with David Senra. David, I always like to ask my guests what they were like growing up. So can you tell me a bit about your childhood and any kind of childhood experiences which shaped you? Want me to start crying already? (laughs) No, don't cry, please. Well, you can if you want to. No, it's it's hilarious because um, one of the things I love about the podcasting medium is just like you feel, it's just like a deeper connection when you hear somebody speak than even writing. Like I'm obsessed with reading, obviously. And I love some of my favorite authors, but the emotional and like human connection that you have with your favorite podcast is just a completely different level. And so sometimes when I have these conversations, I don't know what we're going to talk about in advance. Like it's just as if we met up, right? You know, it's not like you've sent a friend a list of questions beforehand. It's like, okay, well, let, let's just find, you know, something that's interesting to talk about. And so I sometimes get asked these questions about memories I haven't thought about, you know, in like 15, 20 years, that kind of bury stuff in the past. But to answer that specific question, I think one of the, I mean, the most important thing that ever happened in my life is something that I didn't even choose. It's uh, this idea where Jeff Bezos says, like, we don't choose our passions, they choose us, which I think is just absolutely true. Um, If you think about all the things that you become just deeply interested in, you can't really explain why uh, or that you like made a conscious decision to do so. So the biggest thing was just like, I I compulsively read even when I was a, a young kid, and uh, my parents, I didn't grow up with a lot of money. I didn't grow up in an educated house by any means. There was like no books besides like the Bible. And one of the things, like I think the, the nicest things, uh, one of the nicest things my mom ever did. Um, and now that I have kids, I just understand kids of my own. I just understand like the selfless nature of parenting uh, that's inherent in it. And that she would just take me to the bookstore or let me go to the library. But the bookstore is really what pops out. It's just like, just take me to the bookstores and let me like sit there and read. Even if we didn't buy any books, you know, God bless bookstores. They'll just let you sit on the floor and read whatever you want. And so that's like really the main thing where for some reason, I just fell in love with books from a young age and I never stopped. And that's obviously a center piece of of my work. Absolutely. I have obviously listened to many podcasts, not only the ones that you've done on Founders Podcast, but ones that you've appeared on. And I know, and we, we won't go into it now, but I know that your upbringing was fairly difficult. Um, and I think that obviously reading afforded you not a way out, but a way to escape. And I, I see that as quite a common factor with a lot of people that I've interviewed is that there was some way of escaping whatever it was as a child that allowed them to become very passionate about something and almost obsessed about it. And I think I share that quality with you about this kind of obsessiveness. And it does serve you well, because obviously it's what you're doing now. But before we talk about your podcast, can you tell me just a little bit about what you're doing just before you started it? Yeah, I will in one second. I just want to back up on that, too. I think one of the good things about reading, too, and specifically history, though, it allows you to place things in a proper perspective where it may sound, I understand when I like just talk about certain things that happened when I was younger, it sounds extreme, but it pales in comparison to some of these stories that I've read. Um, one example that I've used a few times that I, just, I haven't read the book in like three years and I've never forgotten, and it's the Chung Ju Young, the founder of Hyundai. Um, and so when people are like, oh, 
I had a rough upbringing. I was like, yeah, but were you the son of a poor farmer? And did you have to eat tree bark in the winter to survive? Like he's growing up in unbelievably terrible circumstances. There's crazy stories in his autobiography. That is the most inspiring autobiography that I've ever read because it starts out so terribly. Like imagine when you're a kid and you're, you know, five, six years old, and you're playing at your friend's house and, you know, you have to go to the bathroom and you can't go to the bathroom anywhere else because you have to go home and you have to shit in a bucket because your family needs that for their meager crops. And if you don't do this, you may starve to death in the winter. And so I do think that there is the benefit of, of spending so much time reading history is it allows you to step outside of yourself and realize that like the, the human experience, what you feels like, oh my God, this is my life. We kind of are like super focused and narrow minded on like, I'm going through this. It's like nothing we're going through is unique. And in many cases, people have had not only survived, but thrive through much more difficult circumstances. And I personally find that very inspiring. It's like, oh, like, okay, I have a problem today. Well, that's nothing compared to what, uh, you know, what Chung Ju Young had to go through or what Sam Bronfman had to go through or what Jim Clark had to go through or any of the people that I studied. Or even I was thinking the other day about Francis Ford Coppola because uh, I love reading about filmmakers. And the crazy thing about Francis Ford Coppola is it's like he grew up in, you know, humble circumstances, right? But imagine having a dad that comes up to you and says, there can only be one genius in the family and it's me. Like who talks to their kids that way? And then Francis's response of having this just intense, intense work ethic at a young age and trying to break into his industry. You know, he was famous before he was a director. He would do anything in the movie industry. He knew he wanted to be a director, but like he would just like make sure that when he got hired to do a job, his boss comes out the next morning they'd see him sleep, that he never left the office. Like he'd fall asleep, you know, on e editing the movie. Like completely, it gave him this like obsessive drive to prove his father wrong. Um, so I, I do think that's like very comforting. The most unexpected feedback I get from the podcast is that word. They find it comforting. It's like, oh, like there's another person that thought just like me or another person that just went to that same exact experience. So I think that's like really important to think about. So what I was working on right before the podcast is something that, I wasn't even particularly interested in. I had started a bunch of businesses. I was always just, I look at entrepreneurship as like a, a way out, right? It's like, if you can come up with a product that makes somebody else's life better, they will give you money. And then that money buys you freedom to do what you want. Not, I, I look at it very much like Charlie Munger, where he's just like, he's sitting in his law office. He's doing a bunch of legal work for all these uh, rich businessmen in LA. And he's like, they have an, a freedom and independence that I will never have if I stay being a lawyer for my whole life. So what he did was actually really smart. He took uh, the first hour of his day and he sold it back to himself, right? He's like, I'm going to spend an hour a day learning real estate development and investing. And he did that for a very long time until the point where he was 41 years old and he can actually become a, a full-time investor. So I had this business that was, uh, it was called RoboDB. It was a way to track the origination of these things. And I don't know if you guys have them in, in Europe, but America has been pounded by robocalls for forever better now, but I still get them to my phone every day. And so anyways, I was developing a system where you could actually track the true origination from that number through the US payment network. And so you could also sell that data to attorneys who would then do like class action lawsuits against these people, because there was a regulation called the TCPA Act that allowed for a private right to action for this one specific narrow use case. This is extremely niche. What, why did you come up with this idea? Brilliant, by the way. But how did you come up with it? I was actually, there was this company called Twilio. Uh, it still exists. It's actually a public company now. But back in 2000, and this is something I also learned from the biographies, like you never want to be doing what everybody else is doing. There's a reason why my show is the way it is. It's just like, this is very weird. It's just like one guy reading, you know, hundreds of entrepreneurial biographies where podcasts is usually th thought of like, it's either like a scripted show or like an interview show. Mine's neither, right? And so I got extremely interested in this trend that is now actually becoming more popular, but it's now like AI powered. But like, I would say seven, eight years ago, everybody was building like chatbots. I don't know if you remember that trend. So Twilio was the resource for people building chatbots because it allows you to essentially like it's an API for SMS. It does other things like that, but that's what I was using for. So I was working on like, uh, I was always interested in personal finance and automating finances. And I had this idea for this personal finance chatbot. And I was working on that. And then I was 
paying attention to what Twilio was doing and how other people were using the use cases. Uber, for example, was using Twilio to send like text messages, uh, like when your ride was there. So Twilio was getting really popular. There's all these people building interesting things on it. And I saw something where the FTC was offering like a $50,000 bounty or reward if somebody could come up with some way to block robocalls. And the people actually won that and it came in second or third place. Uh, essentially, like they would identify a number. They'd have like hundreds of thousands of phone numbers and they would see a number calling numbers over and over again. And then immediately like blacklist that and they'd build apps. So like you could pay, I think like five bucks a month or $2 a month or something like that. And you get the block list and they would identify the robocalls and block it from there. Um, but the only problem with that is the people would just, it's all software. So the people would just say, okay, well, I'll just change that caller ID number, right? And then they'll just do it again tomorrow. And then I started reading, um, there's like testimony where this one guy, he got sued for like $250 million or something like that. And he was testifying in Congress where he's like, he said something like, oh, and a lot of the stuff is offshore too. And he's like, I could call every single phone number in the United States for like $600. And so I was realized like, oh, like they're, they're, that's not going to stop it. And because you need something that cannot be uh, manipulated. Like you can't, you could change, if you could change the caller ID number every day and you could do that for $600 and people are paying you, you know, this guy's making, I think he made hundreds of millions of dollars, uh, initiating robocalls. Um, I was like, oh, okay, well, what's the one thing that you can't change? And since in the United States, it's September 11th, like the, there's a lot of regulation around, uh, transferring of money. You know, you have anti-money laundering laws, you have know your customer laws. And so what I realized is like, oh. Well, if you could just actually, instead of blocking the number, you should pick up the number and buy whatever they're selling. And therefore, like you could just get the data from the credit card company and they'll tell you where the money went. And so that's where I, I had the idea. It's like a weird combination of these other like disparate ideas and not something I was planning on doing by any means. <laughs> and then, so tell me about the podcast. So you're, during this time, I think it was 2016. Like you said, there were, I mean, even now there's, oh, well, there might be some more up and coming now trying to emulate you, but there wasn't at the time. There was not many podcasts, podcasts, even on entrepreneurship at the time, as far as I recall. So tell me what prompted you to start the podcast? This is a, the, the biggest, the one, I just had, um, so I was lucky enough to be invited. I get to have dinner with one of my heroes. I spent three hours at Charlie Munger's house. He was incredible, but here's so many ideas that I learned from him. And I think one of the most important things is like, you have to maneuver yourself. All the value in the world is going to go to the people that are like, especially now where we're all connected. It's like, you have to figure out how you can be the best in the world at something or as close to the best in the world as something as possible. And the only way to do that is taking the advice that Charlie gives. It's like, you have to maneuver yourself into a career where you have intense interest. And if you have intense interest and you don't quit, time will carry most of the weight. But that that like desire, this compulsiveness to want to work or to get really good at this, or just be interested in it. Um, really, it all the problems that people have where a lot of their work is like there. It's like the motivation is not an issue. Discipline is not an issue. It's like you're not it's not that you're unmotivated. It's not that you're not disciplined. I mean, it could be those things, but it's just like you're just working on shit that you're not interested in and just find what are you interested in? And so if you looked at a Venn diagram of the things I'm interested in, this is like I like podcasting. I like reading. I like entrepreneurship and I like history. That is literally founders is sitting at the, the beginning of that. So here's your question. I had no, I never started the podcast thinking that like it'd be what it is or like this is going to be what I did forever. It's like I was just obsessed with podcasts and I was obsessed before there was something even called podcasts. I just liked hearing people talk. Back when I was a kid, you'd have to like literally AM radio stations. Like you would just, there'd be a couple of them, maybe like six that you get access or something like that. And guess what? You don't get to pick the programming. This is like whatever they're talking about. Maybe they're talking about sports or maybe they're talking about politics or maybe talking about life advice, whatever. I would just listen to that endlessly. And then the radio stations eventually started like streaming online. So you could like listen instead of listening in the car or like on a radio, you could listen in the browser, but it still wasn't on demand. And the crazy thing that changed everything is when podcasting was invented. It's like, wait a minute here. This is on demand audio available at the same time all over the world on whatever you want to listen to. And I was just completely fucking obsessed. And so I would just listen to podcasts and podcasts and podcasts. And I was like, clearly, David, like the problem is, is I'm, I'm building businesses or products where I'm just doing it because it, like, because I, I want, like, I want to make money. Right. But the problem is, it's very dangerous if when you're not working 
for an entrepreneur, like you're not thinking about it anymore. Because again, all in, in today's world, all the gains are going to go to the obsessed and the focused and, and not the people that are distracted or multitasking. And so I just started the podcast just because I was like, oh, this would be fun. Like you could just set it up. It doesn't take long. I think I recorded my first like 200 episodes with like a hundred dollar mic, you know, and like some $30 a month editing software. So it's not like a huge, there's no investment required. And I was just like, I like to read books. And I had heard this guy named Jocko on Tim Ferriss's podcast back, I think in 2015, I thought the interview was incredible. I started listening to Jocko's podcast and it's just Jocko sitting there with a co-host who his co-host doesn't really talk much. And he's, and he's in, in like an hour, he's just reading and talking about interesting, uh, like this essentially autobiographies of people that had been in combat. And I was like, so interested in not only was I learning a lot, then I'd buy the books and I'd learn like a ton. Right. I was like, man, I should, somebody should do this, but they should do this for like biographies of not people in war, but like, like history's greatest people. And that's how it started. And then I eventually narrowed it to like, no, 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 not history's greatest people. Why don't I do like biographies of entrepreneurs? That'd be really interesting. And so it's, again, it wasn't a plan thing. It was just like this slow iteration and kind of just following my intense interest uh, wherever, you know, that may lead me. And that's, I guess, what most really successful entrepreneurs do is they follow their passion to some degree, because I've heard so many people say that you can't continue with the workload, however tough things get, you can't continue with it if you're not genuinely passionate about it, which really comes across because I listened yesterday to your very first episode. And although it's not obviously the same quality, I, you haven't changed. It's pretty much the same format. <laughs> you know what I mean? There's, there's yeah. little change other than the audio. And I think that's what people are drawn to. Like you said earlier, you were talking about it being comforting and how it comforts people. And I thought, actually, that's so true because I can't, I don't know, it's such a weird thing to say, but I can't be alone with my thoughts. Like ever since I was little, I hate to say it, but if I went to the bathroom, I'd have to take a book with me. I, I didn't like not like consuming something. I had to be kind of learning all the time. And the great thing about podcasts, I'm mm -hmm. listening to podcasts for hours a day. I have no greater joy than listening to podcasts and learning. And I think it doesn't even need to be instructive. It doesn't need to be a podcast that goes, here are the top 10 lessons from ABC. You know, it's really yep. just listening to people's stories. I find it so interesting. But I want to ask you, because I can't remember exactly how I first heard about you. I know it was a couple of years ago. I think it was during the pandemic. And I think somebody who I already listened to, for some reason, I thought it was my first million, but I'm not sure it was. It was, I don't know, it was a male podcast host. And I thought there was two of them. And they had you on. So what they did was they said, we don't normally do this, but for today's show, because we love this guy so much, and we love his podcast, we're going to release one of his episodes. Now, do you know who was that? Do you know who it was? Oh, my God. I don't even know. They may have done this and not told Without me. You I don't know. know. Uh, yeah, I have, I have no idea. I have to find out because it was so good. And it was just, uh, yeah, OK, I'll find out who it was. But anyway, so obviously that was the first time I heard about you. But even then the popularity wasn't the same as it is now. So I want to ask you, for you, how was it in the first few years when maybe you weren't obviously as popular as you are now, but also what was the tipping point? So I, I'm i very, very happy. What Essentially, my audience is like 50 x in the last six to nine months, which is just unheard of in podcasts. Essentially, like I was just building a podcast in relative anonymity for five years. And then it just gets... It got the attention of the right people. And I also had had shot myself in the foot. And um, because what I did was like, I could not figure out, like, I remember when I started podcasting, I was like, okay, maybe I can figure this out, like turn this into a business. And it'd be like, what if I could do this full time? That'd be crazy, right? That's like a dream job. And I couldn't figure it out because like you, you would approach podcast networks at the time. This is such a long time ago. And they wouldn't even like talk to you unless you had like, I think like 50,000 downloads an episode or something, some number like that. And I was just like, I'll never, like, how the hell would I get 50,000 people to listen? This is, and now obviously Founders is, is bigger than that. And it's just like, I was like, oh, this sucks. Like, I'm never going to be able to, to do this for a living. And so I realized like, well, there's all these like paid newsletters. Like, why wouldn't there be a paid podcast? You know, it's just like, uh, and the, the economics was, were relatively si simple. It's just like, okay, well, let's say you had, you know, 30,000 people or whatever uh, listening to like the free version, maybe 10% would convert to the paid version. I bet you I can get 3,000 people paying $100 a year to listen to founders, you know, and it's just like, you're not, 
like that's a you know it's like a being a dentist it's like good money like like to read books for a living that's crazy and so i went down that path for a while and i just had uh a bunch of people like just push me in the direction uh i just went on acquired show uh my friends ben and david they were they have this you know very successful technology business history podcast and this is like a year ago and they they're like hey um why don't we get on zoom and we get on zoom together and like man your show's good you're just doing it wrong and they opened up everything they're like this is how many downloads we have this is what we this is what we charge advertisers this is who our advertisers are look at the difference between the people that listen to the free feed compared to the paid feed because they also had a paid feed as well and they're like for every one person that'll pay for your podcast david there's at least a hundred and i would say there's probably a thousand that would listen to it for free and they really nudged me in that direction at the same time though founders had this weird uh very dedicated listenership you know i only had a couple thousand paid subscribers um like i could have done that forever you know and but they were very influential and they would send it to other founders and investors and so eventually it got the attention of patrick o'shaughnessy from invest like the best who's got you know this giant very successful podcast and so like a year ago i didn't know patrick i i I listened to a show i was a fan of a show but we didn't i never exchanged messages we didn't know each other and then he just, I'm, I remember the day my Twitter goes, started going crazy. I think I had like 6,000 followers or something like that at the time. And I was like, what the hell is going on? And Patrick had said, Hey, I never find good, uh, podcasts to listen to. I think David Senra's founders podcast is excellent. You should check it out. And it was still a private podcast at that time. So he, you had to pay f- to listen to the full episodes. And my friend, I had met this guy named Sam Hinkey, uh, former GM of uh, set Philadelphia 76ers. Uh, now he's an investor in Silicon Valley. And we'd been talking previously and I knew he was friends with Patrick. And so I had text the screenshot of that to Sam. I was like, oh shit, look at this. And he immediately put me and Patrick in a chat together. He's like, you guys should know each other. And then uh, me and Patrick talked like a few minutes later. We wanted to talk for like an hour, hour and a half. We just wanted to be friends. We had the same interests, the same, like we were both into really into entrepreneurship, both love podcasting both had listened to each other's shows so it's like real easy to become friends if you have two podcasters that that have heard each other's shows it's like immediate friendship and patrick said this it's just like man like uh what happened is like after like the fifth person told me that i had to listen to your show i finally listened to it you know the first time he's like okay that's fine second time he's like okay i'll I'll buy a subscription but never listen and then third fourth he's like all right i'm gonna listen what the hell's going on here and these are people again this is the, the key that you can't plan for it's like influential people that they trust the judgment of are telling Patrick, this is good. That pushes him over to, let me listen. Let me see for myself if it's good. Oh, it is good. Okay, let me share with other people. And then what happened was this, these conversations I had with Ben and Dave from Acquired, talking to Patrick, talking to other people. I'm like, I really like what I'm doing. I think it's, I know it's really valuable to other people in my bones. I go, I am going to take a risk here. I'm going to stop selling subscriptions, which could you know put me in a financial hole if I'm not successful here. Uh, but I believe that if somebody interested in entrepreneurship has the ability to go into their podcast app and either select the podcast where this crazy guy has read 250 biographies of entrepreneurs at the time, now it's almost 300, and you have a choice between like, tapping on founders or tapping on another show, I think I'm going to like compete very well against other people. Because I also know how serious I take it. I work on it seven days a week. I'm obsessed. Like, I'm trying to build a first class product, but I'm also trying to match it with first class work ethic, which is also rare in podcasting. And so I was like, I'm just going to, I'm going to rip the bandaid off. I'm going to say, I'm not going to sell any more subscriptions and I'm going to just, I'm going to make a public version. I'm going to compete on a level playing field and I'm going to put trust that I'll find advertisers that'll back me up here. And so then I was like, okay, what's the best way to do this? I called Patrick. Uh, We'd, you know, become friends by that time. And I knew he was telling people about founders. I was like, hey, um, I'm going to do an ad-based version of Founders. He's like, oh, that's interesting. And I go, I think it should be on your network because Patrick's got this giant audience. He's got an entire podcast network. And he's like, ooh. And, you know, we worked out a deal right then. He's like the easiest, nicest person to deal with. And three or four weeks later, he had me on his show. And that show went, audio doesn't really go viral, but that show spread around a lot. It wound up being his like fourth most downloaded episode last year. And overnight, you know, I had tens of thousands of more listeners. And then ever since then, I've just been building on the momentum. It's so interesting, isn't it? Because like you said earlier about the uh, work ethic of podcasters, I think what you mean is there's so many 
that will be quite infrequent with their episodes that they'll do it as part of their I don't know sometimes it's a vanity project for people sometimes it's part of like advertising their business and they realize actually what's required in it and I think there's a stat isn't there that there's like 98% 98% of podcasts never get past, I don't know, episode 40 or something. It's ridiculous. And then you think, actually, because I sometimes search for random things or people on Apple Podcasts and I'll be like, oh, this person did a good podcast, but they only did like five and that was it. But it's so That's interesting nothing. to watch because, like I said, I've been watching you now for two years and I think it's been so interesting to see everyone coming on board. And like you said, uh, you said, oh, audio doesn't go viral. Well, it does. It really does. I know it's not in the same way. But I want to ask you, because one thing that does make a lot of podcasts go viral, and I've definitely noticed this in the last, or maybe two years now, is video. And we started talking before we were recording about audio versus video. I want to ask you, why are you not doing video? This is actually an idea too. First of all, I never did video on my own, but I didn't realize why I wasn't doing video. This is an idea I learned from Patrick because uh, he's like, listen, we're making a podcast because if you look at like not only the size of his audience, but the average net worth, I would make the argument he's got the most valuable business audience in the world for like average net worth and like what the influence those people have. And so his whole point was it's like, well, David, you and I are making podcasts for the most successful people in the world. The most successful people in the world don't sit around watching YouTube all day. Like they're listening to your podcast when their eyes are busy. So they're driving, they're on a walk, they're commuting, they're flying somewhere, uh, they're working out. These people are literally building businesses, right? Uh, spending an enormous amount of time on their career. And they're not the kind of people like we talked before. It's like, I listen to podcasts and I read books. I don't watch much TV. I, I love movies, but I'm just not going to sit there and binge watch, you know, 15 hours of a show. I just, I, I get more out of reading a book or a podcast. Like this morning, I, was, uh, I went for a walk, listen to a podcast. I was at the gym listening to a podcast. Like that's two hours of like, when my eyes are busy, I'm still getting something out of it. I have not sat down yet today and watched any video and I probably won't. Mm. <laughs> and so that's one of the reasons like who's listening to my podcast. So these are very unbelievably successful people. And so I know they're not sitting around watching video. The second thing is like it's added complexity where even if you talk to like other business podcasts, maybe video is like 10% of their audience. But if you know, like when you have an audio file, like there's a, du- there's a double-sided leverage. This is another idea I got from Patrick. There's a double-sided leverage to audio. It's easier to produce and it's easier to consume. So when I make a podcast, it might be 100 megabytes, right? <laughs> so easy to deal with, to edit, to store. Now I deal with video. I just went uh, on the Acquired Podcast. I flew to San Francisco and they do both video and audio. So the, the, the audio of that, I think was like, they sent me the file because I published it on my podcast feed. I, I forgot. Maybe let's say it's 200, 300 megabytes. But when they have multiple cameras and high definition, I think they're, they have to wrangle with like 500 gigabytes of video. Then they got to send it to an editor. It's just so much more complexity where it's just like, I like to keep things simple. It just works. I don't need video. Mm, that's the thing. I've always dabbled with the idea of doing video because I see lots of people do, having their clips go viral. And I think, oh, well, you know, I have such fantastic guests. It would be fantastic. And also I, I want to support the guests and do what other people are doing. I don't want them to feel they're on some kind of lesser podcast because I don't do that. But I just bring it back all the time to the fact that audio is the most important thing for a podcast. And I get totally get why people do filmed versions of it. And some people are creating. I know Lex Friedman, he puts shows out there that are three hours long. And I get that someone will sit there and watch it as though it's a movie. But like you said, most people don't have time to do that. So I think audio is for me where I'm sticking. I've got some random questions for you because I'm trying to ask you questions that you haven't been asked before. So If they're a bit left field, I do apologize. But one of the questions I had was, what's a biography that hasn't been written yet about an entrepreneur throughout history, which you desperately want to read? So is there someone that you know about, but there isn't a biography about and you wish there was? Great question. I was listening to your episode with my friend Jimmy Sony. And so I literally texted him about this yesterday. Uh, Jim Sinegal, the founder of Costco, there desperately needs to be a biography on him. He has built one of the greatest American companies ever it's got a cult-like following it is not only like the customer aspect loves costco but it's unbelievably financially successful how the hell is there no biography on jim senegal and so i you know i become friends with some of the authors that i've read their books for the podcast jimmy being one of them and i was like jimmy i know you got enough ideas (laughs) but if you're ever interested in this just reach out see if he'd be interested because you know i think he's almost 80 now he might be even jim Jim's probably maybe 70s, might be 80 now. 
And I was like, I just like if you could just interview him and see if he'd be interested in like working on this product. Oh, he's 80. I just looked it up. He's 87. We got to get to Jim right now. He's just such an interesting person. And he's just dedicated his life to building his business. There's so much stuff in his in that guy's head that I would just love to see put into a book. Um, you know, hopefully he lives, you know, another 15 years, but oh, it's going to be devastating if that doesn't happen. See, that's the thing. I always think, so a lot of the people I interview are people who were around in the early days of um, personal computers and things like that. And like you said, when you looked them up, sometimes I look up people and I'm like, damn, they've already passed. Like, this is so frustrating. Like, why didn't I know about them earlier? And there's so many like women who were involved in the early days of personal computers and they're, they're either not around or, or don't do interviews, which is always a thing. But I just think, God, there's so many fantastic people. And as soon as I find out about someone, I go down the rabbit hole and then I'm so disappointed when, you know, they've already passed. I want to ask you, what do you think makes a good biography? And have you ever read a bad one? Oh, I read bad ones all the time. Um, There is. So the crazy thing is like so many. If I if I don't like the book, it I never I can't I'm not going to make a podcast about it. Right. Mm -hmm. I'm I'm not a critic. I'm not going to sit here and be like, oh, well, I would have done that. Like, Mm -hmm. that's ridiculous. I think. The world has enough critics. We need more evangelists. So I'm trying to put things out into the world that I think like, wow, you should listen to us. Wow, look at this cool idea. Wow, that you might be able to use this in your business. So I've read, I don't even know how many now, 10 to 15, maybe 20 uh, of the books. Sometimes like one time I got, I think like four pages in, I was like this, no, no, no. This, uh, it was like a, like a hit piece. Like, I don't like, you know, Mm -hmm. I don't, I didn't like that. So, um, and then sometimes I, I literally get to the very end and I'm like, man, I'm not going to make a podcast on this. Like, this isn't, I, I didn't like this. Uh, so what makes, let me start with what it makes a bad one. One is, same thing I would think makes a bad product. Like, are you intensely interested in the subject? Or are you just writing it? Or are you just doing it to, like, get a paycheck? And I think there's some cases where, like, the per, you could tell the author's, like, not really into it. Jimmy, when you hear him, like, on your uh, interview with him, look at all the work that that guy did before he even knew he was going to write the book. Like that's, that's a good sign. There's a reason why his book, The Founders is so good. The guy put in six years of research. That's crazy. PayPal, by the time it was started to sold to eBay, only lasted four years. I tell him all the time, like, dude, you did more research than the company lasted as an independent company. Like, that's crazy, right? Um, so that's what makes a bad one is like, you're just not interested in it. Look at, look at Robert Caro, you know, arguably the greatest biographer. I can't think of a, a, another one. Yeah, Isaacson's obviously good. Chernow's good. There's a bunch of other people that are good, but I think Carl's in a class by himself. Um, I'm actually working through the LBJ books right now, and I've, I've read The Power Broker before. And he's just like intensely interested in the subject. Uh, Willie's dedicated his whole life to it. And I've never come across books that are so long, yet every sentence matters. Like, it's just incredible that he's done that. Um, so that's that would be like an example of, I guess the other side of that coin is like, intense interest usually will lead to a good biography and something that you're kind of like half-assing like anything in, in life like it's not gonna be good it's gonna be mediocre and at that point you you know wasted a year or two of your life of your very precious life on making a mediocre product like that's not that's not a good outcome or good use of your limited time but the other thing i would say is don't spend too much time sometimes it's like they're going back like five generations i'm like no no no. i don't want to know what their great 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 grandmother did Right. It's like you need a, you need some background. Like we started this conversation on the childhood. Right. It, when I tell you, hey, uh, I knew when I was born, I wanted to do better. And uh, reading helped me, you know, a great deal on self-improvement and probably made me more driven. That tells you everything you need to know about me. I don't have to go into detail about like my great, great grandfather or, or I don't even know who the hell he is anyways. Mm-hmm. I couldn't anyways. But point being is like you're just going way too far back. Tell me about their parents or relationship with their parents. Right. Tell me instead of 25% of the book about being like their family history, make it like 5%. What people are interested in is the climb. The, they start at X and they wound up over here. How the hell did that happen? That is what people are interested in. And then after they're already rich, successful, famous, et cetera, et cetera, don't spend another 20% of the book on, you know, their philanthropic efforts. They just all do the same shit. Like, I'm glad that they donate money and do and do other things with their money, but that is not relatable to you and I. Me and you are not donating are not building like later on today. We're not going to go dedicate a hospital named after us, right? Like, like I'll read about that when I get there. Like, but everybody's relatable. It's like, man, this is what I didn't like about my early life. 
oh, there's this obsession. Oh, this is me trying to succeed and failing, trying to succeed again and failing again and trying and trying and trying one step forward, two steps back. Everybody relates to that. And that is where all the value is. That's where they're like figuring it out. I got the chance to talk to Charlie Munger about this because I'm like, man, Charlie, you're 99. You're a multi-billionaire. You're obviously brilliant. He's got a cult-like following. I go, but what I've been doing is I spent the, week, the previous week reading about you when, you when you were like 35, when you were like 41, when you were like 50. And I go, you could see in his life story, he's starting to figure it out. He's making mistakes, but he's learning from them. And he would even tell you, it's like the 41-year-old version of Charlie Munger would get his ass kicked by the 65-year-old version of Charlie Munger. That's the interesting part. It's like, okay, he, he, the, the younger version directed the path, and then you see how he works it out and kind of figures out. I just told you like a, a brief history of me. It's like trying to figure out, I was like, this doesn't feel right. This does not feel, this, I, I would say it's like life is a search for like what you're uniquely meant to do, what I consider your life's work. Right. And if you haven't found it yet, you got to keep like it's like try like you got to try on something else. Try on another business, just like you try on another outfit, like try to figure this shit out. And then if you know right when you know it's not this is not it. Just do that transition. So I just do the transition slowly, but life is too valuable and important and rare. Such a rare thing to even be alive to like waste, spend half of the time you're awake working on something you don't care about. That doesn't make any sense to me. And it took me. So I'm like 33 years to figure that out. And then, you know, then be willing to work on it in relative anonymity and mediocre success and just trust that I'm going to figure this out. Like, I just thought, I was like, oh, okay, if I give my everything to this, I know I'll figure it out. Like, I'm obsessed with it. I'll find the relationships. I'll find the ways in and I'll just keep building on it. And I know to compound because there's no fucking way I'm going to quit. You know, I interviewed someone recently who he came from a difficult upbringing and he is now CEO of, well, he's a turnaround tech CEO. So he's worked at various companies and he's taken them to like billion euro exits. And this is something he couldn't have conceived of as a child. And he said that once you've experienced, well, I'm paraphrasing, but he said something along the lines of once you've experienced hardship and you've survived it, then you know you can pretty much do anything. Like you almost, you have the leverage. And I think that's so true. Like once you find your calling and you know that you can keep going and outstrip most others, you can follow it through. Another kind of left field <laughs> question, which I thought of this morning actually was, do you think that in this kind of current climate that our tolerance of genius is waning? Because when I think back to all the wonderful books that you cover, they're often of entrepreneurs that are from probably my parents' generation. And although so many of them might have been ridiculed at the time, they weren't scorned every single day, all day long on Twitter and in the press. And I wonder, do you think that now that we have a habit of kind of editing or deleting history, you know, we've got all these books that are being banned, how is that going to impact the kind of biographies of the future? You know, where people admit that they're working 80 hours a week or whatever it is mm -hmm. how do you think that's going to impact biographies of the future do you think people are going to either not write about these people that are working their butts off or or edit it so that people don't feel bad if they're not no I, humans like the losers are the ones that are in the like the cheap seats and like being negative like you're not going to find michael jordan or jeff bezos going around being negative online right like they just got other stuff to do with their lives and human nature doesn't change we all admire excellence now i think the more intelligent ones see excellence and like like okay what does that person know that i can learn uh but there's a, a mass majority of humanity that's just like you know envious or jealous or they like they took somebody else's success and thinks that like they they automatically compare where they are in life and like it makes them uncomfortable this is something i learned from charlie munger he's like the world's not driven by greed it's driven by envy and envy has no utility you must cure to have a good life you must cure yourself of envy I get to talk to all kinds of amazing people that listen to my podcast. Almost all of them are way wealthier than I am, right? I don't like, oh, I look at that. I was like, oh, that's motivating. Oh, this guy's really smart. I get to have dinner with him. Like, what can I learn from him? And there's a lot of people, who, like the people you're saying, that ones that go around on social media leaving negative comments. It's just like they don't, they don't look at it like that. And so therefore, they actually miss the valuable lessons that actually change their lives. And I would say that for the most part, like social media is all fake. Twitter's all fake. I don't think the people that I cover, the people that I talk to is like, they're completely, they understand like 
you should be once you find your life's work and you know what you're doing is that like, you love to do it and it's valuable to other people, right? Because that's all like Henry Ford says, money comes naturally as a result of service. All a business is, what Richard Branson says, all a business is, is an idea that makes somebody else's life better. Once you find somebody, you have an idea that makes somebody else's life better and you like to do it, you need to be indifferent to the opinions of others. There's not one person on the fucking planet that could convince me not to do what I'm doing because I believe it in myself. This is what Charlie Munger said at dinner. He says he always had an inner clock. You can go to Charlie today and be like, hey, you shouldn't do X and Y and Z. He's indifferent to your opinion. He knows, he trusts his own judgment and he knows what he's going to do. And I think having that inner clock like the biographies are still going to be written. There's going to be still great entrepreneurs today. There's going to be still great athletes. There's going to be still great scientists and great inventors. I would say that there is too much emphasis on this random discussion of a bunch of losers online. Very well said. I do agree with you. But I did also wonder, what do you see as the connection between, because I've written about this before, but what's the co connection between madness and genius? So for those that achieve extreme success in whatever field they do, how crazy do they have to be? And I don't mean crazy as in like, you know, totally mental, but the perception is that they are totally mental. Because even if you think back to the Wright brothers or throughout history, it's not just now that people kind of comment on the fact that someone who's bloody brilliant is probably mad. Do you see a connection when you've done all these close to 300 podcasts? Do you see a connection between it? Yeah, it's just being lost to your work. It, the Wright brothers are a great example. Because it's like absolutely ridiculous. Like two brothers with no education, they're all self-taught, right? Uh, in Ohio, right, are going to solve this ancient problem. The, the idea like that, that's one of the, actually might be the best example because human powered flight was not a new problem like in the age of the Wright brothers. It is literally something humans have been writing and documenting for thousands of years. And it took humanity's best minds that have ever been produced have attempted to solve the problem that they wind up solving and they failed. And these people are so well known, like they go by one name, like Da Vinci, Newton, Archimedes. And then even in the Wright brothers own time, right? It's like they own a bicycle shop, like a bicycle shop in nowhere, Ohio. And they're competing against Alexander Graham Bell and Thomas Edison and Samuel Langley. Samuel Langley was backed. I think the, they had, he had almost 500 times more funding than the Wright brothers did. If you think of all the money invested for the Wright brothers experiments to actually solve this ancient problem, it comes down to like something like $1,500. And they got the $1,500. Those were the modest profits of their bicycle business. So this idea where like, do you think the Wright brothers went on Twitter, would have went on Twitter, like, hey, I'm going to solve this problem. What do you guys think? And then everybody says, you're stupid. You know where you're going to do it. Because that's exactly what they would say. Like, you're crazy. It's never going to happen. Da Vinci couldn't do it. Bell can't do it. Langley's going to kick your ass, et cetera, et cetera. Like, and then they're like, oh, okay, thanks guys for your opinion. I just, I won't do it. They don't give a fuck about your opinion. And that's the biggest thing I try to tell people, man. Cause like I meet so many people where like, they're so smart and yet they don't have the self-confidence to overcome the opinions of others. I'm like, Hey, it's human nature. People don't think about other people. Think about the most important person. And I'm not talking about like your, your lovers, right? Your children your best friends. That's what I'm talking about. I'm talking about people you admire you, that you don't actually know personally, like you, you, your favorite uh, actor, singer, podcaster, whatever it is. You think about them for 0.000001% of your entire life. They're not thinking about you. So therefore, once you realize that humans are so self-evolved that all they're thinking about is like, oh, what do I got to do today? Like they're thinking about their life. Then that frees you. Tim Urban's got this great quote. Maybe we could put it or a great post. We could put it in the show notes. And it's called like the, the mammoth. Let me uh, Google it real quick. So I don't, I don't, I want to get the actual, um, he's got a great title to it too. Oh, why you should stop. I don't, it's fantastic. Taming the mammoth. Why you should stop caring about other, what other people think. I reread this thing every year at least. And it's just like the mind plays tricks on you where you think everybody else is worried about what you're doing or what you're working on or the tweet that you put out or the podcast you did or anything else. It's like, Fact is, no one's really paying attention. They're thinking about themselves. Even if you make a big mistake, they'll forget it the next day. And so I think that personality type where it's just like, damn what you think. I want to work on this, so I'm going to do this has been present throughout history. I think it exists today. I think it'll just exist in the future. Another example of is when Henry Ford starts working on the internal combustion engine, most of the, first of all, there's not that many cars. For every car on the road, there's like 3,600 horses. So he's doing something that's weird, right? And then of the cars that are on the road, most of them are electric or steam. 
And he's like, no, I'm going to do a gas powered engine. People are like, what the hell is wrong with you? Mm -hmm. He worked in an electrical company and the, the guy, they tried to fight, they told him he had to leave. They're like, listen, you can either work here or you can work, do your experiments on your internal combustion engine, but you can't do both. And so Henry Ford goes, I, I quit. I'm, I'm going to work on this because I want to work on this. So I think that the best advice is to understand one, people aren't thinking about you. And two, you just have to be indifferent to the opinions of others. Just do the work necessary to trust your own judgment. That doesn't mean you're not going to make mistakes. That doesn't mean you don't take in new information. Of course you do. But I'm making founders no matter what, because I want to do it. There's people every day. They're like, they try to tell me, it's like, oh, I love your podcast. You should do the other thing. Like, no, I'm going to do this because I want to do this. I'm indifferent to their opinions. That's one of the lessons, I guess, from listening to your podcast is that people should take away the lesson that if you're absolutely determined to do something, you should do it. And also, as we were talking earlier about learning the history, there are so many people that don't learn more about history. And I think when they're starting a business now, it's really interesting to not look back just at your kind of field, but the field of others. Like I know CEOs and founders today who will often study other great people in different fields to learn ways that they did something, whether it be about culture, the business side of it. And they learn so much and they pass that on. So there's so many leadership lessons in your podcast. Another question I had, which again might be a bit left field, is you obviously cover a lot of biographies where it will detail the whole life of that person from a young age to old age. So I wanted to know, what advice do you have for old age based on what you've learned? This is another Charlie Mungerism. The best protection for, from old age is a, a well-lived life preceding it. And if you're waiting to change until, you know, you're 80, like, you have to make decisions based on the, the best framework for this is like what Jeff Bezos did when he decided to leave the hedge fund he's working in New York to start Amazon. And he calls it the regret minimization framework. And it's this idea where he's like, okay, well, I'm 30 years old, already really successful, working for a billionaire hedge fund manager named David Shaw. And, you know, was married, had a beautiful apartment, I think, uh, in Manhattan, was about to get a giant quarterly bonus. And he's like, I'm, but the thing is, is like, I really think that the internet is a once in a lifetime event. Uh, I want to play a role in this creation of this brand new industry. I know that when I'm 80 years old and I'm looking back on my life and I see my 30 year old self having the opportunity to try to play a role in this industry, that even if that 30 year old self try and failed, I'd be okay with that. What I wouldn't be okay with is I played it safe and I did a job that I didn't want to do. And I just kept on like the path that it was on. And so when he goes, when you make a decision like that, he's like, I knew when I was 80, I was not going to worry that I quit and I'm not going to get a quarterly bonus. You don't give a shit about a quarterly bonus that happened 50 years before. You care, like, did you take advantage of this unique experience, this magical odyssey that we call life? Did you actually take advantage and make the most of it or not? And it's shocking. Most people go to their grave never doing it. They play it safe. They know they want to change. They know they want to do something different and they never do it because they're scared. And my point is like, what are you scared of? We're all ending up at the same place. We're all going to be in the dirt. Like you have to go for it. You're going to fucking die. That is the only thing that you have to worry about. It's like, there's an end to this. You don't have to worry about, oh, I, I tried something I really want to do and I failed. So what? At least you tried. That's better than the people sitting on Twitter being mean all day. They aren't doing anything. Indeed. I don't know if that answered your question. I don't know. It, yeah, I don't know if it's No, okay. it's good. Do you know what? I just, while I was listening to it, I was thinking, God, I need to like some snippet, some of these uh, quotes that you're coming out with and you're going to be my self-help guru. I'm going to have you <laughs> on my phone and play these things where you're saying, bloody go for it. A couple more questions. I wanted to ask if your autobiography was written, if someone, whether it's you or somebody else decided to write about you, what's something that you would want us all to know or those that you leave behind what do you want as part of your legacy that we don't already know about you what do you want people to know about you i don't deserve a biography yet and so that's really my thing is like I, i'm very happy that the podcast founders is like well received i'm incredibly happy that people get a lot of value out of it and when they say these nice things it's like yes i appreciate you saying that i don't deserve it yet and so um i just i, I can't there's no benefit to me where, you know, people say these nice things where it's like, once you start believing that you stop doing the work and everything good for my life comes from the fact that I just wake up every day. I read a biography for a few hours. And then once a week, I try to put what I learned into a format that is beneficial to other people. And so as long as I focus on that and I never stop doing that, then when I'm 60 or 70 or 80, 
we can write a biography about, you know, hopefully the impact I had on, on other people that were alive at the same time I was. But right now, I would say it's way too premature. I have barely done anything. I think the impact that I could have is going to be a million times greater than it is now. And then hopefully I'll be wiser because I'm still in my 30s. Like the smartest 30 year old is still like average compared to a semi successful and 60 year old that survived. You know, there's this uneven distribution when it comes to age and experience. Like just being around, like I, I got a chance to have not only dinner with Charlie Munger, who's 99, but also had lunch with Sam Zell, who's 81. It's just like when I was talking to Sam, he was asking me all these questions. I was like, Sam, you have six decades of entrepreneurial experience. You were building businesses and making millions of dollars decades before I was born. Like he doesn't know double what I know just because he's roughly twice my age or whatever the case is. He knows a thousand times more because he just had so much more experience. And so I would not recommend people writing biographies or autobiographies early in age. There are some examples where they did that, where there's like snapshots where somebody else wrote a biography, like Michael Moritz wrote this fantastic book called Return to the Little Kingdom. It's about Steve Jobs and Apple. And it ends, the book ends, it's only about like the first like six year history of uh, Apple or the first 10 year history of Apple, maybe. But the book ends, Steve's still at Apple for the first time. I think that's fascinating because it's like 29 or 30. I think he's 29 years old when the book ends and then he gets kicked out when he's 30. And so you get like this snapshot in time. But other than seeing it for a snapshot in time, I, I think that uh, the ones with experience, the older people, the older, wiser people with experience are, they're essentially like a different species from even like a relatively smart, you know, 20 or 30 something year old. They just know and they've seen so many things. Um, and you really can't derive that knowledge other than like through time. Okay. I do agree with you, but what I want to do now is just to take a moment because when I read about your story or when I listen to podcasts that you're on, I always think to myself, God, I wonder if he knows what he's giving to kids like who you were. So when I think to your childhood and the fact that you have said yourself that you didn't have some great role models within your immediate family growing up or even like your grandparents, and I think you found your solace in books and you found your way out in books. And now there's a whole generation of people that will grow up on podcasts. And I wonder, because you work so relentlessly and you're so obsessed, which I'm sure is partly shaped, that kind of work ethic is shaped from your childhood. Do you ever take a moment to think about the impact that you're having now? Not, I'm not talking about, I know in 60 years time, you're going to have more impact. But right now, there are young people and they might be young founders, or they might just be young people who are not necessarily going down the entrepreneurial route, but they listen to your stories that you share and the kind of advice that you give as a way of a summary of the book. And that impact will change their trajectory. And I wonder if you ever stop to think about that. I hope that is the outcome. And no, I never think about it. But here's the thing. Like once you, this is something that like, I want to be one of the few people that are capable of learning from history right? Where so many people and learning to me is not memorizing information. Learning is changing your behavior. And I appreciate what people say. I am deeply grateful. Don't get me wrong. The problem is, is like human history is like when you have any level of success, you start to think it's about you and that I'm special. And look what I've done. And that causes you to then like you go to sleep on a win, you, you wake up with a loss. It's like, I'm very happy about that, but it's not me. It's just at work. And so as long as I keep doing the work, then everything else will take care of itself. So that's the way I think about it. It's just like, I'm just going to keep doing this and then I'm going to put it onto the world. And once I put it onto the world, I don't have control over it. Whatever it is, if it motivates you, inspires you, like that is beyond my control. That's the outcome I want for sure. But I can't start thinking about it. All I can think about is like, how do I make this week, right now, today, how can I make sure I'm spending time? Am I actually understanding the book I'm reading? Am I, can I place it in the context of all the other stuff that I've read? And then when I sit down and record, is this the best it could possibly be? And so that's what I try to focus on where, you know, I'm very happy it's well-received, but I think focusing on the praise, the positive adulation is just, it's not good for humans. We're not meant to be, you're just not meant to be praised by so many people. And it's, again, fantastic, but my job is just to focus on the work. And if I focus on the work, then I will get everything I want out of life. Whilst I totally understand your point, I would argue that it is you. 
and your work is a part of that. But it is you. People listen to you. And there could be, because if you think about it, in this day and age, you've got something that's doing really well. Anyone could now say, right, well, this is what I'm going to do. I see it all the time. People see like a winning method, whether it's a podcast, a newsletter or whatever, and they try and emulate it. And they could do word for word. They could literally do the same books. They could do this, put the same amount of hours in, but it won't be the same. And that's something. And I get why you don't want to stop. But I think that I just I hope that when you have a moment to yourself, which I know you probably don't allow yourself much of, but I hope you do realize that it is you and you can take that as a heartwarming envelope around yourself and be able to move on. And it won't detract you from your work. It will just give you that kind of cuddle that a young David might have required. But anyway, I won't, I won't dwell on it. I, I, uh, this is something I talked to Sam about because he did not, Sam Zell did not want to write his autobiography. He was like, so it's hard to write it. He, then he wrote it and he's like, it's the best thing I ever did. And he's like, Mondays are my favorite days now. And I'm like, why? And he's like, that's when me and my team go over all of like, the, we, they get positive messages every week and then they like just read them and go through them on Mondays. And he's just like, it just makes you feel good. That's the same thing where like, I get these great DMs or emails, you know, every day. And so, yeah, I, I'm like very appreciative of that. I, I completely like it, it. It's unbelievable. Like, I just cannot believe I get to do this as work. The point I was making is just like, don't. Like, OK, cool. I use this like more motivation than, oh, I'm special. Like, I don't think what's special is that you've done it for seven years and you haven't quit yet. And hopefully you've done a bunch of practice and you're getting better at it. But that those, those lessons are not they're not unique to me. They're not unique to podcasting. There's literally everything. Everything in the world is reps, reps, reps. You mentioned earlier about how many people quit on podcasting. People quit at everything. And they're, and when you quit at something, you never get really great at it. And so you're doing yourself a disservice when you give up because all the benefits are 5, 10, 15 years into the future. It's very true. And I know Charlie Munger, I think you alluded to the quote earlier where he talks about, I don't know, I think it's just sticking at it really. And whether it takes a long time or not, sticking at the same thing and having that focus is invaluable. I've got two more quick questions. One is I reached out to Sam Parr of my first million podcast. Obviously, he's an entrepreneur investor as well. And I asked him if there was a question that I should ask you. And it, it, the first thing he said was that he admires you. But obviously, I know you don't want to dwell on that. But um, he also asked whether you would ever be inspired to quit podcasting and follow the path of someone you have read about, i.e. become a founder, which in many ways you are, because obviously what you've got now is building into what I would say will soon be a media empire. But do you ever get tempted? Never. I knew you were going to say that. I, I wasn't even I no, wasn't sure if I should ask. I, I, I like Sam. Sam's been nice to me as well. And he just recently invited me to go on his podcast. So hopefully we have a discussion as well. But um, no, because what I think what people are not understanding, I get this thing a lot. They're like, why don't you start a company? I was like, what do you think Founders is? Mm. Like, I think it's, this is also the weird advantage I have, which is like, it is the, I feel uh, if you can make a world-class podcast, which is certainly the endeavor I'm trying to go down and trying to do is like, those are some of the best businesses in the world. Because where else could you have one person that could potentially affect millions? Whether one person listens to my podcast or millions listen to my podcast, right? I'm doing the same amount of work. And so like I, the idea is like I could have one person sitting alone in the room and essentially over my lifetime impact or alter like millions and millions of people, right? And then as that scales, the business scales beautifully, it has no expenses. It, you'd be shocked at how good of a business it is right now. Like it's just insane. And then from there, like there's a million different things you could do. Like right now it's ad-based, right? But eventually, like, you could just say, hey, uh, I'm not going to sell advertising anymore. The only people that advertise on my podcast are businesses that I own equity in. And then it scales even further. Like, it's amazing to me how many people think it's like this, like, side thing. Not Sam. Sam knows the power mm -hmm. of podcasting because, like, he's got a giant audience and he knows the value in it. But my point is, just like, it's so much bit more beneficial for me to spend my time doing something that only I can do. This is, goes back to Edwin Land, one of my personal heroes. I learned about him through Steve Jobs, who was one of Steve Jobs' personal heroes. And when Edwin Land developed his own personal motto, um, you know, he says, hey, listen, I have a personal motto. It only applies to me. It may not work for other people, but he's like, don't do anything that somebody else can do. And I think that's actually like really good advice on how to build a differentiated product because all of the value accrues to truly differentiated products. And so my whole thing is like, there's a million other people that could launch a similar business or service to businesses that I could, you know, do, right? But I don't think there's anybody else that can do founders the way I do it as, like you said, an extension of my personality. 
And so, no, and I, I think the, the benefits are just now starting to compound. Um, I don't think there's any limit to the amount of people that can listen. I don't think that business and entrepreneurship is a niche subject at all. I'm actually shocked that we haven't had a good entrepreneurship podcast that, that doesn't already have millions and millions of listeners. I think that is an inevitability. I think I have a good shot if I stay in the game to be one of many that are able to accomplish that. And at that point, like if you get to that level, then what do you have? Well, you have the most valuable media company that's owned by one person in the world. Why would I do anything else? Exactly. I was talking to someone recently. It was Jen Fan of Passion Fruit. And I was saying, because she runs a business as a platform for podcasters and creators, YouTubers, et cetera. And they can put their information up about their downloads and everything. And then brands can reach out to them and sponsor adverts or whatever and I said to her I wonder now because she has that oversight of all these creators and, and what they're capable of and what they're achieving and I just wondered how long before investors start investing in creators and I think it's already starting to happen apparently that you know you might see a podcast that's up and coming and then you invest in that person and then you've got a cut of their media empire I think it's going to be is, more common this is this happened over a dozen times. Mm. Like I've had, I, I, I stopped counting. I don't know, 10, 15, 20. I don't even know how many, but like how many times people approach me to like either buy the whole thing completely or to buy equity in it. Like it already is happening. And so, what do you say? What have you, because I know you're obviously with Patrick now, but what's your reaction to it? No. Yeah. But Patrick's the easiest person to work with in the world. Um, he owns all the other shows on his network. He doesn't own mine. It's just a partnership on advertising revenue. That's it. And it's just like, because he asked, he's like, what do you want from me? I was like, I don't want, I don't need anything. He's like, do you want uh, editors or researchers? I was like, no, no, no. Like founders to me is like a one person. Like I'm, it's like a, a, a handmade product at scale because it's like, I, I do everything. I pick the books, I read it, I edit it. I do everything, right? No one touches the podcast. No one knows what I'm doing in advance. Um, the only difference is, is like, I picked a product that, you know, has zero replication costs so can scale to millions of people right from one to millions of people and so all i i told patrick i said all i need you is to help me amplify my audience and connect me with first rate advertisers so like the people if people advertise on uh founders they'll go through the ceo of colossus network and he'll deal with the contracts and collecting the payment and all the other stuff right um and so i'm like the easiest person to deal with at colossus because they never need anything from me they just know that no matter what come hell or high water david's putting up an episode every week and we don't even hear, have to hear anything. And they're fun to work with and high quality people. But the answer to everything, people have tried to put millions of dollars in my hand. That's not exactly like millions. No, the answer is no. This is, I know it's a, technically a business, but the way to think about it is really an obsession. And I'll get all that money anyways. And I'll just own 100% of it. And like, uh, I don't have to deal with anybody. I like simplicity and nothing in my life gets better. Where I'm like, hey, you know what? Let me take this thing I love. And you don't want to make it better? Let me add a bunch of fucking other people's opinions to it. That never makes anything better. I like what I have. I love it. I'm going to be one of the best in the world at it. Like, the only thing I could do now is, it was the, the, the way to mess that up is to relinquish independence and relinquish control. And there's nothing you can do. This is the greatest thing that I've ever heard because I've become friends with the Andrew Huberman's, uh, like him and his team. And they've been unbelievable. They have one of the biggest podcasts in the world. And they've been unbelievably supportive of me. It's crazy because they listen to the podcast. Andrew tweeted out yesterday some crazy shit. And every time he tweets about Founders Podcast, he like sends me up the charts. And he says, he goes, yours is a consistently amazing podcast. It's thoughtful, insightful, and the energy is superb. I learn every time. It's clearly in your heart and blood to learn and teach, right? And the reason I brought him up is because I was listening to him on another podcast. And he said, he goes, you could pay me a billion dollars and I wouldn't stop podcasting. He goes, because I love teaching and I love podcasting and I'm going to do it for the rest of my life. He's not doing it for the money. And here's the thing. The people that are doing it for the love and the obsession, those are the ones that get the money anyways. That's what people don't understand. You'll get it anyways. You'll fuck it up if you sell it to somebody else, you let somebody else control it. And then you, what happens is when you get take money from other people, they have a say in it. And then if they have a say in it that conflicts with what you want to make, you don't love it as much anymore. And then if you don't love it as much anymore, it's not going to be as great as it can be. Don't give up the independence for money. Hold on to control and you'll get the money anyways. 
It is very true. And you only have to interview enough founders to know that once there's so many founders that have either sold a stake in their company or sold their company and had to carry on working under the umbrella of another. And they all regret it. They all regret the way it's gone afterwards. But anyway, final question, which I ask everyone is, we obviously start at the beginning with your childhood. I wanted to know if you could go back in time, what's one piece of advice you'd offer a younger David? Spend more time finding work you truly love and less time chasing money. I like it. David, thank you so much for your time today. I really appreciate it. Of course. Thank you for having me. Thank you so much for listening to my conversation with the fantastic David Semra of Founders Podcast. If you liked it, please do rate and review. It always helps me know what episodes you find most compelling so I can do more of them. And I believe it helps others to find these episodes too. As always, I like to leave you with a quote. And today I have two, both of which were inspired by my guest who has covered their stories on his show. The first one is from Chong Ju Yong of Hyundai, which I have always called Hyundai. Uh, it's the car company. And the book is Born of This Land, My Life Story. He says, whatever it is, it can be done by the person who thinks they can do it. The success or failure of any work depends on the mindset and attitude of the person doing the work. Even theoretically and academically impossible things can be accomplished if supported by an enterprising spirit, a pioneering mind and passionate effort. The power of the mind is the source to achieve these things. And the second quote is from David's absolute hero, Charlie Munger, who says... I just stay away from the problems that can't be fixed and pick the ones that can. I don't like unlimited failure. I don't want to fish forever and never catch a fish. I have to have some reinforcement. And so I pick some things that can be done and do them. I think that if you're reasonably obsessed with something, even if it's intermittent, and you have a long attention span, you keep working over the serious problems that you'll stumble into an answer. That's half the secret.